Eventually, after a few weeks, I'll get the hang of this, that I have to turn the microphone on. Blessed are you that made it through the icy streets and the stormy, stormy weather here. Um, it is so good to be together. And we are going to light the Christ candle. And the reason that we do that is we remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who comes to me does not walk in darkness, but has the light of life. And we light this candle, and it's a good practice to do, even when we spend time alone with the Lord, to remember that the light of Christ, on a week when many of us have gone without light, is with us always. So I want to invite you to stand for our call of worship, if you are able. In the midst of darkness, there is light. In the midst of blindness, we will be given sight. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, brings healing love to us. Let the light of Jesus' love break through our blindness and fill our world with glory. Let's worship God together. pray. Holy One, you set pathways for us to follow, clearing the way in the wilderness of the world, and yet we break your heart by wandering off, pursuing our own purposes. Still, you keep calling us back. You call us by name in our baptisms. You set us in the world to serve you, each one with a purpose you imagine for us. And so we come to worship you, O oh God, knowing that in you we will find our true purpose. And the path you set will lead to peace and well-being in your deep love revealed for us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now let's sing in the green hymnal, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Please be seated. Assured that the one who calls us to hear and obey already knows the confessions of our hearts and is ready to forgive, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. The one who pardons, heals, and strengthens all who repent calls us to name our failings and our hopes. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one. First in corporate prayer and then in silent confession. God of mercy, we confess that we resist change, even when your word compels us to consider our actions or opinions. We are set in our ways and prefer to consider the changes others should make. Forgive us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, give us new eyes for seeing, new ears for hearing, so that we may follow Jesus more faithfully day by day. in a position to condemn only Christ and Christ died for us Christ rose for us Christ reigns in power for us Christ prays for us believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and set free to make a new start thanks, thanks be God. to God On? You can hear me now. Okay. Now we have the opportunity. So we confess. We go through this process of remembering who we are in light of who God is. And then we are given the words that remind us that we are forgiven. These words of assurance. And then we get to hold the peace that comes from knowing that we've been forgiven, that we live freely. And our call is to pass that peace on to the world. So we start in this room and then we go outward. But first, I want to invite you to stand up and we're going to pass the peace on to those who are watching online. So that narrow, that narrow camera, let's pass the peace. May the peace of Christ be with you who are watching online with us. 
And now, congregation, may the peace of Christ that reminds you that you are forgiven and loved and held and free be with each of you. Pass the peace. Sorry, my fingers.
Let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word as we pray. Creator God, your word set creation in motion and your Holy Spirit to set our minds in motion. As we listen to the scriptures today, add to our insight and challenge our assumptions for the sake of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 62, 5 to 12, page 898 in your pew Bible or in whatever electronic device you look at your Bible, <laughs> used to, to look at Bible verses. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress, I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times. You people pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighted on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And your reward, you reward everyone according to what they have done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've been practicing lifting weights so that I can do this every week. <laughs> oh, well, good morning, Hillsborough Presbyterian Church. Um, my goodness, on week three, and I, we've already had to cancel one of, my, one of my three weeks. It feels a bit odd to have had to call it on my second week here, but it is so good to be together in person. We live up on a hill in West Lynn, so I don't think I drove for six days straight because our entire street was not only an ice rink, but the best sledding hill in West Lynn, really. So we spent this last week sledding and making a lot of different types of soup and a lot of hot chocolate and sitting by the fire, even though we have one of those, you know, the fires that doesn't actually get very warm. It's not a wood-burning fire, so it's sort of a joke, but we pretended that it was keeping us warm. Um, well, because for many of us, last week and the last couple of weeks probably felt a bit like a blur, I want to revisit the sermon series that we are in and remind you that we are in a series called Good Question, Getting to Know Jesus Through the Questions That He Asks. So we are in our third, third week, so if you missed the last two weeks or if you are new or visiting us online today, we have been looking at some of the questions that Jesus asked in Scripture. We've been sitting with those questions. We've been holding them and wondering about them, inviting them to shape our understanding of who Jesus is and who God is inviting us to be through those questions. In Scripture, Jesus asked more than 300 questions. And even though there are only 183 questions that are recorded that are asked of Jesus, he only is said to have answered directly eight of those questions. So that tells us that the primary way that Jesus communicated was through questions and also through parables, which both forms of those communication require a great deal of listener interaction and engagement. Jesus asked questions to connect with people. Jesus asked questions to challenge people and to transform people. So by spending some time with the questions that Jesus asked, we will discover a bit more of the heart of God. And hopefully, we will find his questions kind of poking and prodding at our own hearts as well. That is my prayer as I have been preparing these sermons. 
hopefully pushing against some of this, the assumptions that we have made as well. Two weeks ago, we looked at the question on light in Mark 4. The question was, do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? And we explored how that rhetorical question, even though it had a seemingly obvious answer, was asked to challenge the assumptions that people had that Jesus came only for a small handful of people, a select few, those who were well-behaved or those who were religious or liked. Instead, Jesus, the light, came for all. And then last week, if you were able to join us online, and I need to pause for a moment and thank Steve Deaver for his incredible work on making sure that got up online and also his willingness to read scripture on there as well. So thank you, Steve, for your work on that. I think he spent hours piecing that together. So let's not forget, when you don't see someone working behind the scenes, that took a lot of work. Um, But last week, if you were able to join us, we went through a series of five questions that were kind of asked in very quick progressive order, and they were all on worry. So um, we noted that the questions were a direct response to the command, do not worry. It was as though those five questions were there to create a focal point. Do you remember God's faithfulness? Do you remember that God has always been good and always providing? So it was that focal point, those do not worry, and then question, question, question. Was, they were there to remind us to fix our eyes on the only thing that does not change, the only one who will not change. God has and always will be the one that we can trust to order our chaos when life feels out of control. So that was last week. Now this week, we have the privilege of peeking into an interaction between Jesus and blind Bartimaeus. This is one of my favorite scripture passages, and it's also a scripture passage that's used a lot in spiritual formation to help probe um, some of the the questions that Jesus might want to ask us about what we want. So we'll get there. But I invite you today to wonder with me over the significance of the interaction between Jesus and Bartimaeus and the layers that might be embedded in this question that Jesus asks. So we're going to read Mark 10, 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. Mercy on me! Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man. Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Here's the question. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Well, our passage for today started with verse 46, and it opens with the word then, which should prompt us always when we see a word like that to ask the question, when? So if we look, if we kind of turn our, if you actually have your Bible open, you can turn back, but you don't have to because I'll summarize for you. But if we look at what came just before Jesus' interaction with Bartimaeus, we will see that moment where, and this is my shameless plug for The Chosen, if you haven't watched it, it is so well done. And yes, thank you. It is so good. But anyway, so this probably isn't what James and John looked like, um, but we're going to go with it because they are James and John in The Chosen. Um, But James and John, son of Zebedee, known as sons of thunder, 
This is the, so directly above Bartimaeus is when James and John ask Jesus if they can sit on the right and the left of Jesus in God's kingdom. And they want the privilege of sharing in the glory of God. This then leads the disciples to get really jealous, which gives Jesus the opportunity to remind them yet again that the Son of Man did not come to be served, and this is actually in the passage directly above. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, you don't know what you're asking. My way is not your way, so stop being so blind. And because we know that each gospel story is woven into a larger gospel theme, it would help us to remember again that the gospel of Mark is emphasized over and over and over again that God came in a very mysterious and very unpredictable way. And even those closest to him didn't understand just who he was or how God's kingdom works. It was just too backwards for them to accept that God came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So these two brothers, James and John, completely oblivious, and for lack of a better word or term, blinded, by their desire, their passion, these sons of thunder, to be the greatest in God's kingdom, are the ones who set the scene for what is to come. So these two help us to understand the context of the next passage, which is what we are going to lean into. Then, then they come into Jericho and encounter a physically blind man named Bartimaeus, who ironically seems to see so much more clearly than they do, right? They they have been journeying with Jesus for all these years, and yet Bartimaeus is the one that seems to get it. Bartimaeus is the one that cries out. And what's interesting is that Bartimaeus is the only person in the Gospel of Mark who is named, the only healed person, So Jesus performed a lot of miracles in the Gospel of Mark, but Bartimaeus is the only one who's given a name. Why is that? Well, we can only guess. The name Bartimaeus, Bar, means son in Aramaic, and Timaeus means Timothy. But to the early reader of Mark's Gospel, it could have brought to mind a famous essay written by Plato called Timaeus. I'm going to read a portion of this, and I'm going to put it on the screen because I know some of you are auditory learners, some are visual learners, so it might help. But I wonder if by putting the name Bartimaeus, the only name of a healed person in this passage, if this was brought to mind by the early listeners. Plato writes, the sight, in my opinion, is the source of the greatest benefit to us. For had we never seen the stars and the sun and the heaven, none of the worlds which we, had, which we have spoken about the universe would ever have been uttered. And from this source we've derived philosophy, than which no greater good was or will be given by the gods to mortal man. This is the greatest boon of sight. And of the lesser benefits, why should I speak? Even the ordinary man, if he were deprived of them, would bewail his loss but in vain. God invented and gave us sight that we might behold the courses of intelligence in the heaven and apply them to the courses of our own intelligence, which are akin to them. I'm going to read that last sentence one more time. God invented and gave us sight that we might behold the courses of intelligence, capital I, in the heaven, and apply them to the courses of our own intelligence, which are akin to them. There may be absolutely no connection whatsoever, but could it be that this name Bartimaeus was inserted in the gospel story as a subtle way of echoing back to a familiar text that would reiterate in the minds of the listeners the importance of sight, or to encourage the listener to wonder about what it means to truly see or maybe to question what it makes, what makes someone truly blind. Maybe. And maybe not. It's just an interesting detail that could have held significance for the early listener. So 
So back to our story. This is the very last healing that Jesus does before entering Jerusalem, where he will be crucified. And yet, despite his fixed gaze on what is coming, we are told in verse 49 that Jesus stopped on his way. Why did he stop? First, I believe he stopped because Jesus is interruptible. And that is something I aspire to be better at, especially after a week of having my children at home who I love so much. Their school was canceled, my work was not canceled. So I aspire to be graciously interruptible, and I am not, but Jesus is, always. Over and over and over again, Jesus is interrupted. But I also believe that Jesus stopped because Jesus saw something in the blind man that no one else saw. And the blind man saw something in Jesus that very few were able to see as well. I have always been fascinated with uh, this artwork that got its fame in the early 90s called Magic Eye. If you are familiar with it, it um, is a brand of art that has these hidden 3D images behind a kind of chaotic surface level um, picture. And really, you can see the real image hidden inside the forward-facing art. But the only way to see it is to is to relax your eye in a way that you focus beyond the surface level and see deeper into the picture. And it was all the rage as I was growing up. I remember having a book myself of it and trying to impress my friends when they would come over with how well I could see the picture behind the picture. Um, I did bring one to show you, so I wanna give you a moment to see if you can see the, and this is just a 3D, so there's not a, necessarily a hidden picture, there's just a 3D image that will pop out. So I'll give you, I don't know, 30 seconds to see if you could figure it out. And if you get it, raise your hand. It's hard on the screen, isn't it? Did you get it? A little bit? What do you see? Oh, it's a word? Now I gotta look closer. I only saw 3D fish jumping out. <laughs> well, I won't distract you too. We can put it up maybe when the service is over and you can play a little bit with it. But, um, but these pictures provide a beautiful illustration for the ability to see beyond the surface level to what is actually happening below. Let's take it down so that it's <laughs> not too, everybody's like, what? is that. Um, <laughs> so, similarly, Jesus, the presenting image, was just a carpenter from Nazareth. And that's all most people saw when they saw him. He was Joseph and Mary's kid. He was the one who got left behind at the temple because he had to stay at his father's house. And nobody understood what that meant. He was the cousin of the eccentric guy who was baptizing people and eating honey and locusts in the desert. But Bartimaeus saw something different. His blindness was only skin deep. He could see with the eyes of his heart. And he seemed to know with his whole being that this man who was passing by was not just an ordinary teacher. He wasn't just a simple rabbi. So he called out and Jesus stopped. Most people could not see the king behind the carpenter. Just like most people could not see the wisdom behind a blind beggar. But by inviting him to speak for all to hear, Jesus offered Bartimaeus his dignity. And he offered the crowd another chance to understand how God's kingdom works. And I wonder if that very act of throwing his cloak aside was Bartimaeus' way of throwing aside the weight that he'd always carried. The weight that was imposed on him by others that made him feel invisible, discarded, and voiceless. What do you want me to do for you? The question seems so silly in light of the fact that Jesus, Jesus was staring a blind man in the face. What do you mean? Of course he wants his sight. Seriously? 
but Jesus never asks empty questions, does he? This was not a silly question. I believe it was a question intended to go far deeper than the surface level. Sure, he could heal his eyes without even asking, but Jesus was offering so much more than vision repair. By giving Bartimaeus the chance to speak up, maybe for the first time in his life, this blind beggar was seen, he was seen as a human, He was seen as someone with needs and a voice and given dignity. He was noticed, singled out, lifted up, invited to share what he really wanted. What do you want me to do for you? And I imagine that voice so loving, so gentle. Now is your chance. You get a turn to speak. Your voice matters. Rabbi, I want to see. This word used for rabbi was the only time in Mark's gospel that it was used in Aramaic. The reason that that matters is because it was a very deeply respectful term that meant my teacher. My teacher. Bartimaeus got it. He couldn't see with his eyes, but he could see with his heart. Bartimaeus saw, he cried out, he voiced his needs, and his faith healed him. Mark's gospel is all about seeing. Who could and who couldn't? Who was willing to try to see the picture beyond the presenting image? And who just couldn't imagine a reality in which the Son of God came to serve rather than to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many? The questions Jesus asked nudged those listening toward clearer vision. The question Jesus asked of Bartimaeus brought dignity, voice, and honor to a man who had likely never experienced it before. I wonder how we would answer that question. It's a good one to sit with. Imagine Jesus sitting next to you. Or, I think as Jesus does, placing his hands on your face, looking you in the eyes and saying, what, dear one, do you want me to do for you? In his book, Befriending Our Desires, author Philip Sheldrake says, and I have the quote again for visual learners, desire lies at the heart of what it is to be human. There's an energy within all of us that haunts us and can either lead us to set out on a quest for something more, or it can frustrate us by making us nostalgic for what we do not have. This is true of all of us. In in its deepest sense, it's a God-given dimension of human identity. It pushes us through the limitations of the present moment and of our present places toward a future that is beyond our ability to conceive. The one who came to serve, not to be served, turned and asked the least of these, what do you want me to do for you? Desire is what propelled Bartimaeus toward Jesus. And in the words of Philip Sheldrake, desire is what pushed Bartimaeus through his limitations, his blindness, toward a future that was beyond his ability to even conceive. It is also what propelled James and John toward fame because it was misdirected desire. It is human to desire. So what would it look like for us to bring our desires to Jesus and allow Jesus to shape those desires toward him? May we have the wisdom of Bartimaeus to answer. My teacher, I want to see. I'm going to pray for us. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful that you stop. You are interruptible. That you turn in a crowd. That you invite us forward. That you look us in the eyes and that you give us voice to tell you what it is that we want. Shape our desires. Help us to see you. Holy One, we want to see Jesus. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. Because we don't um, take offering physically here, I'm going to pray over our offering, and I'm also going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. So we'll pray together, and then I will pray over our offering. Um, So let's pray. God, you give. Everything we have is from you. So we pray that you loosen our grip on the things that we're holding on to, that we insist on keeping. Because you're a generous God. So Lord, open our hands. The things that we hold in our hands, the worries we have over the people we love, the concerns that we have over our ailments, our body aches, the things that weigh us down or wake us up in the middle of the night, we want to give to you in this time. In the silence, hear our prayers, Lord. And Lord, for the things that we just don't even have words to pray for, the groans in our world, the pain, the devastation, the wars, the fear, we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God of new possibilities in Christ, you breathe a future for each of us, inviting us to flourish in our faith. Use us and the gifts that we offer to create new possibilities for those who are uncertain about what the future holds. For we trust that you hold the future for all of us. Amen. Invite the worship team forward.
Well, we switched it up a little bit. So thank you for your grace and being flexible in how we're doing things. You can be seated just for a moment. I'm going to give a few announcements. So we've moved the announcements below the prayer. So I'm going to get it. Brian told me that it'll take about six weeks. So I still have three after this. So just I'll get it eventually. I promise how we do this. But just a few announcements for you on things that are going on in the life of the church. Big one is congregational meeting is on February 4th, Sunday after church. So please plan to be here. Um, All of your voices matter, and we need you all here to um, help us make it through that congregational meeting. And um, also, if you have not yet had your picture taken for the photo directory, you still have time. However, you don't get to do it today. So we, we didn't plan for that today, but next week, get yourself photo ready because your photo can be taken next week after church. And um, finally, the Gospel of Mark, Lectio Divina, I love that we are doing this. And Rick is um, hosting this every Sunday morning at 9, and he's going to be going through the Gospel of Mark. A lot of the passages that we've been doing for the questions Jesus asked are from Mark's Gospel, and so he chose to journey through the Gospel of Mark in Lectio Divina style, which Lectio Divina, if you are familiar with it, some people properly say Lectio Divina, I still call it Lectio, but um, it is a way of reading scripture meditatively. So we listen to God's word and we allow God's word to exegete us rather than us exegeting scripture. So we allow the words of God's scripture to um, to really, we pay attention to what words or phrases stand out. It's a great way to prepare for worship. So you are invited every Sunday morning to join Rick in the, what room is it again? Says it, yellow room. I'm still learning the rooms around here. I don't even know where the yellow room is, but I'm going to journey around and figure it out. Um, and I think that is all the announcements for today. Oh, tithes and offerings. Yet again, a reminder that we no longer, since COVID, pass Um, the tithes and offerings, so you are invited to either use the QR code or go online and do that. So now I get to give you the benediction, and it seemed most appropriate that the benediction today came um, from Ephesians, Ephesians 1. So our benediction for today is, may the eyes of our hearts be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which we've been called the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints and the incomparably great power that is available to those who know and believe God. May it be so. May our eyes be opened. See you back there.